Hi, my name is Francisco Arriaga. I'm an Extension Soul Scientist with University of Wisconsin-Madison. And uh, today I have a potpourri of topics, if you will, uh, water management, uh, site-specific management, and soil quality. So let's, let's dive into it. So let's talk first about the uh, water solute uh, management issues. So we look at water manage or water movement in soils. Uh, we know that uh, most of that water under saturated conditions will move in response to gravity. So obviously it's going to be moving downward through the larger pores. In unsaturated conditions, so when the soil is not full of water, but it still has a lot of water in it, water is going to be moving uh, due to a gradient. So it's going to be moving um, from wet to dry. Uh, water in the soil, if you recall, is held under a suction or under a tension. And that actually, um, it's what's drive this uh, movement in unsaturated soils. It's this differential in uh, tension or the energy potential of that water. Um, another thing to, to be aware of, it's anytime you have a, um, a difference in textural in the soil profile. So if you have a layer of sand and under that you have a layer of, of clay or silt, uh, anytime you have any type of layering as such, that will impede and affect the movement of water through a soil profile. So, why is this important? Well, a lot of these water relations not only affects the water available for plants to grow, but it also affects the availability of nutrients. So, if you have a scenario where water is deficient, obviously we know that water, um, that a lot of uh, nutrients are taken up by plants uh, with the water. So that presents a problem. Another thing that happens is that if you have limited water, that would actually reduce microbial activity. We know microbes are very important for breaking out organic matter and other processes in the soil. So we'd actually uh, reduce availability because of, of nutrients because it's reducing their activity in the soil. Um, I just mentioned the uh, mass flow delivery of nutrients. That again is referring to those nutrients being so dissolved in the water and the water taking up that water. And also it would reduce the metabolism of the plant because if the plant, it's not, uh, it's, if it's water stress, then it's not going to be uh, functioning properly like, like it should. Um, so the opposite of having a water deficient system or a dry system would be having excess water. We know that this is also a problem. Uh, we can have a lot of problems with denitrification of nitrogen or nitrate. So we'll be losing nitrogen that way. And it also will affect the aeration of the soil. We have yeah, excess water, very little air gas in the soil or soil gas. Um, and so it would, uh, can affect uh, potassium uh, uptake. Here's an example of a field uh, that was uh, flooded after a heavy rainfall. And this was in uh, early June. This is the same field in August. So you can see here that even though you cannot tell in June what was happening, uh, we could deduce that a lot of nitrogen was being lost, and this is evident here by the uh, chlorotic uh, corn crop that we see here. So how can we control excess water? So there's, there's two ways to think about it. So um, water that might be on the soil surface, so we've had problems with water standing on the soil surface or, or excess water in the soil profile. So let's start with the surface water. So if you have water, a lot of water on the surface, you're trying to then move, move that water as uh, effectively as possible, efficiently as possible from the soil uh, surface from the landscape. So there's structures that you can use, such as diversions or waterways to remove that water. Uh, if you have a uh, tile drain, you can actually have surface inlets that's going to help uh, get that water from the surface go into the tile and drain quickly uh, out, of the, out of the field. Um, also, the way that your slope uh, in your fields and um, your different landscapes are, are laid out can have a tremendous impact. So uh, landforming can actually uh, be, be uh, crucial in certain scenarios where it would help drain water or remove uh, surface excess water. Uh, when we're looking at a water in the profile excess water, one of the number one things that is uh, actually practiced here in the state is you, the use of uh, drain tiles can be quite effective. Uh, also very effective at um, reducing erosion because you're removing then the amount of water in the soil and saturation of that soil. So this is also important from the aspect of soil erosion management. Um, one one uh, concern or one thing to keep in mind is that you require an outlet or a ditch uh, to be able to connect uh, to, uh, to a surface water channel. So an area of confluence so we can uh, safely drain that water out of the field, out of the profile. Here's an example of a uh, diversion uh, surface inlet. So you can see it's just a, uh, a pipe with uh, different holes. So if you had excess water in this region here, that water, instead of standing there 
um, or uh, running off and maybe causing concentrated flow and gull erosion or real erosion, it actually can go through this pipe and go into, the, into a tile and, and safely uh, be discharged out of that field. Now, um, another topic I want to talk about a little bit, it's uh, water quality. It ties in very nicely to uh, water management, um, drain management is the uh, that we have to realize that a lot of times we have chemicals and things that we have to use for agricultural production can be a problem uh, to the environment. Uh, one of the issues that we have a lot of times is excess nitrogen. Uh, that can be a problem for groundwater. Uh, it can also cause issues um, further down the stream. So if you've heard, I'm sure you've heard of the uh, hypoxia zone in the in the Gulf of Mexico. So that's that's a problem because it affects uh, fisheries and has also an economic impact because it impacts uh, fisheries and, and those uh, related industries. Um, another issue that uh, we contend with here in Wisconsin, it's uh, phosphorus. Uh, we know that could be a problem for uh, fresh uh, water bodies where it can cause uh, algae uh, blooms and, and uh, reduce oxygen levels in, in uh, water bodies. Um, pesticides have not been in the, in the um, discussion a whole lot lately. Uh, but these can be an issue. They uh, used to be an issue in the 80s and 90s um, where they were found a lot in uh, groundwater. Uh, but I think we have a pretty good hold in control on these. We have good management practice to address those these days. Uh, sediment also can be a problem. If you reach a water column, it can reduce the amount of light that penetrates that water column in a, in a, in a lake, let's say. And so obviously that can affect the biology of that lake. And last but not least, uh, there could be problems with pathogens. If you think about if uh, manure applications and then you have a rainfall event and you have runoff, there could be certain pathogens, certain things that could be carried with that and uh, can create some, uh, some issues uh, down the line. Um, and the reason why we need to be aware of these and cognitives of this, this type of issues is because uh, way too often, I think, uh, agriculture gets blamed for uh, a lot of water issues, either um, rightly so or rightly so, but that's that's uh, something we have to deal with. Uh, so we need to be, I think, very proactive in, in trying to control these issues. Uh, for example, you know, avoiding access to groundwater. You can see this example in an abandoned well. Um, you know, keeping a buffer area around it uh, would be very beneficial in, f in making sure that that um, um, well does not turn into a conduit to groundwater for, let's say, pesticides or even manure. Uh, even better yet, if it's a well that is not used anymore, um, it would be uh, really, really important or, or, or beneficial to just uh, remove that well, cap it, in, uh, and seal that, that well and put it out of, out of uh, production. So there's a lot of things that we can do to uh, protect water quality. Um, for example, nutrient management, I'm sure you have heard about the uh, four R's, the rate, timing, source, and placement. It uh, can be uh, very important and beneficial not, not, on, not only for productivity, but also for water quality protection. Uh, incorporation of manure can be quite useful and help a lot controlling a lot of the issues related to the uh, pathogens and, and uh, phosphorus losses. Uh, crop residue management, again, can be important if you think about erosion and water runoff. Having a residue on the surface avoids uh, surface seals, so it um, helps with infiltration of the water. So if you think about um, water infiltration and runoff, the most in more infiltration you have, the less runoff you're going to have. So the lower the runoff amount, the lower the uh, risk of losing nutrients and sediment. Uh, conservation practices can be very important because of the same uh, effect of reducing erosion and runoff. And then, you know, following the uh, pesticide prohibition in those areas that um, those pesticides uh, should not be applied. I want to switch gears now and talk about precision agriculture. Um, it might seem like an unrelated topic, but if you think about of a lot of these uh, issues that we talked about, water quality and other management, uh, precision agriculture um, and precision ag can really be helpful. Uh, Site-specific management can be very helpful on, on, on helping us manage these more effectively especially if we're um, managing a lot of uh, acres. So uh, when we're talking about precision ag, um, it's usually a two-step process, or at least I like to think about it that way. Uh, so the first one is assessing the variability of your fields or in your operation, and then what you're trying to do is trying to manage that variability. So the way you can assess that variability is by either or doing a, a combination of looking at uh, soil grid sampling, looking at yield maps, uh, looking at maps uh, of electrical conductivity. 
Um, right now, there's a lot of on-the-go sensors, such as the NDVI, that could also uh, be useful in determining uh, variability in a field. So any type of tool that you can use to assess the variability in the field can be useful. Uh, another thing that is important is things like the NDVI and the yield maps. Um, that would be something that you would need several years uh, built into your database to be able to assess the variability, where something like an electrical conductivity map can be used in conjunction to the yield maps, but the electrical conductivity of the soil is not going to change a whole lot from year to year, so it's something that it's a little bit more stable, maybe something you only need to do every 10 years, 15 years. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of variability that can be caused at random, but what we're trying to assess here is a non-random variability, so we're trying to look at essentially at differences in soil. So another way of looking at this would be doing soil, soil, soil maps and looking at your soil maps. And the variability must be sufficiently large uh, and responsive in range to be able to uh, use these uh, precision ag tools in the soil management effectively. So once you figure out the variability of, of your fields in, 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 in your operation, um, then how do we use that to manage the variability? That's what you're trying to do. You, in a way, trying to homogenize a little bit uh, by managing the variability. Um, so you can look at things as variable rate versus uniform rate application. So if you have enough of a variability in a field, then maybe variable rate fertilizer, for example, could be useful. Um, if there's not all variability in that field, uniform rate is just fine. Um, to be able to manage the variability, you need to delineate these management zones, which uh, can be a, a, a complicated process. We'll, we'll go through an example here in a second. And then you need to have some kind of tool in your equipment, some kind of modifications of equipment to be able to do these precision applications. So uh, when we're trying to characterize or delineate the variability in the field, there's several things that we can do. We could use uh, soil surveys. Uh, we can look at different terrain attributes. In this case, uh, we have elevation. That could be a, a, a great tool for looking at that. Uh, here we also have an example of electrical conductivity map. And then also looking at other things such as the texture of the soil and then also the content of organic matter that can give you an idea or, or, or a great tool to delineate in these zones. So once you have all these uh, layers of data, then you can use that to delineate the zones. And, and here where things are become a little bit tricky. So here's a field. Um, it's about 20 acres or so, if I recall correctly. And it's been delineated into five different clusters of five different zones. Uh, in reality, when this field was actually managed, it was managed only as three zones. Uh, the reason being that five clusters or five management zones get to be a little too much uh, for practical purposes. So that's another, another thing that needs to go into the decision scheme when we're looking at uh, some management. It's what is practical. And so that is something that is more of an art than a science, uh, but it's something that we definitely need to uh, be aware of and, and cognizant of uh, when we make management decisions. However, you know, precision act could be quite beneficial. It's not for everybody. Uh, you don't have to go full hog uh, with it either. Um, there's different ways you can do it. Um, so a lot of benefits come from the information you can gather from it. You can have a lot of uh, really nice uh, record of uh, your operations, uh, mineral applications, uh, fertilizer applications, and what have not. Um, you can develop uh, information systems for different factors in, in your operation that can help you guide better uh, uh, management such as purchase of fertilizers or seed and in, in those type of uh, scenarios um, which leads to then uh, decisions on the economics of, of their operation and again like I said doesn't have to be very high tech uh, sometimes you know kind of have an idea of your fields and you can kind of manage them um, a little bit different uh, depending on how those fields lay and how big of that difference is uh, a lot of concerns with uh, precision ag management um, such as the data collection logistics, uh, a lot of concern these days with who owns that data. If you have a working with a company partner, um, there's a lot of concerns of who owns that data and what is that data, where is that data going to be stored and who's going to have access to it. So that's obviously something to have, uh, um, be aware of and have, you know, be concerned of. Uh, also the cost, you know, obviously a lot of times you will need some assistance with this type of uh, scenario. So what is the cost uh, for that operation and is it, at the end of the day, will it be profitable? That's what we're looking at. And then, you know, there's going to be different philosophy. Like I said, some of these decisions are a little bit more art than science. It's what the producer will be uh, comfortable with. So it's maybe the uh, different philosophies as far as crop growing and, and, and management decisions. 
Uh, finally, I just want to discuss a few topics on soil health. Um, and this is a topic that it's been of uh, great interest lately. Um, to me, the importance of soil health is that it integrates between uh, soil physical, chemical, and biological properties, with the biological properties being that link. Organic matter is key for that. And so when we think about, or I think about soil health, I think of uh, these uh, three uh, soil properties overlaying and being that interaction or that um, uh, area where they, they meet. So soil health is essentially the ability of a soil to function in a way that benefits both humans, so we're trying to grow crops and make a profit, but also the, the environment. And there are many factors that affect soil health. Uh, obviously, um, things like texture, organic matter, uh, and all the different soil properties, but also the management. And that's where we can actually make a difference is actually with the management when we're looking at uh, soil health. Now, the issue uh, with soil health is that it can be often subjective. It's not a uh, well-established science yet. Uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll be getting there. Uh, it's not like nutrient management where we have calibration uh, curves and, and uh, those type of things or responses um, where we can measure certain parameter and say, hey, this is going to be the response if you do this type of management. Uh, hopefully, eventually, we'll get there. Uh, right now, there's a lot of assessment out there that try to be more quantitative. Again, uh, have in mind that some of these might not be calibrated for your, uh, the conditions here in the state, and we need to uh, further develop these. Uh, but they could be useful, especially if you're using them in a scenario where you're looking at it over time. So you're assessing those every, I don't know, three to five years for the same field and, and seeing how uh, that soil responds to different management uh, scenarios. And it is very important because it affects productivity and affects water quality, affects so many different things uh, um, in the environment and in, in the production system. So here's an example of a, of a field. Uh, you can see the variability of that field here on the, on the map on the left. And so obviously the different zones are going to have different uh, qualities, soil qualities, if you will. And you can see here on the flyover, you can see that that um, can greatly affect uh, the productivity of, of the field, just even visually in this case. So again, what we're talking about is the same management principles that we have talked in the past, but now we're kind of looking at it as a whole package and we're looking at it as, 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 a, as a whole, as opposed to looking at just the fertility by itself or looking at the tillage by itself. But now we're thinking about the fertility, the tillage and the biology. How is that all affecting my uh, production of, of my field, my soils? So hopefully that will lead to more sustainable uh, productivity and more resilient soil. So. Uh, healthy soils usually lead to uh, um, a greater buffer capacity of the soils within, let's say, things like um, a drought. If you uh, like a little bit more information and uh, uh, review other topics, I direct you to the A3588 publication, Management of Wisconsin Soils. Mm -hmm.